Catholic History Trek, a podcast exploring the Catholic past. I'd like to start out this episode of Catholic History Trek with something a little different from our normal opening. I'd like to play a quick game of Can You Name the Saint? Basically, I'll provide some clues, and the objective is to figure out which saint I am describing. The first clue is that the saint is from Assisi. Perhaps one of the most famous saints in history, and the topic of a previous episode, St. Francis of Assisi, was from Assisi, so he's an obvious choice. But it can't be that easy, can it? After all, if you recall from that episode, St. Clare, for whom the Second Order Franciscans, or Poor Clares, was started, is also from Assisi. Or maybe the question is real tricky, and the answer is her younger sister, St. Agnes of Assisi. Well, to eliminate some of these choices, for the next clue, I'll mention the saint is a male saint. That eliminates both Claire and Agnes, and that also makes St. Francis of Assisi the more likely choice, right? One additional clue is that the saint was a member of a religious order. Again, St. Francis seems the obvious answer. He did establish the Order of the Friars Minor, or Franciscans. For the next clue, I'll say the saint was given the name Francis. That seemingly all but locks up the answer as St. Francis of Assisi. But here's where I'll throw a curveball. For the final clue, our specific saint was supposedly a skilled shooter, adept with a handgun. That changes things a bit. While St. Francis of Assisi at one time desired a life of chivalry and battles, his earthly life predates the era when firearms became a common fixture on the battlefield. So, who is this mystery saint from Assisi who is the member of a religious community named Francis and apparently knew his way with a handgun? The answer is the subject of this episode of Catholic History Trek, St. Gabriel Pacenti. Francesco Pacenti was born in Assisi on March 1st of 1838 as the 11th child of Sante and Agnes. The family moved from Assisi to Spoleto in 1841, and by the time Francesco was four, he had lost a six-month-old sibling, a nine-year-old sister, and finally his mother. In the latter part of that decade, he also lost an older brother, Paul, who had fought in what had been called the First Italian War of Independence which was waged between Austria and various Italian republics and kingdoms, and was won in a long line of battles seeking to confiscate the Papal States, and was a precursor to the Risorgimento, which ultimately saw the Papal States seized by Italy, as described in our Catholic History Trek episode on the history of the Papal States. Francesco later lost a brother, Lawrence, who took his own life. Despite, or possibly because, of the wars and death surrounding him, Francesco developed a life of holiness. He was educated at the Christian Brothers School and then at the Jesuit College at Spoleto. Against his father's wishes, who desired for his son to live a worldly life, Francesco was called to a religious vocation and joined the Congregation of the Passionists immediately after the completion of his secular education. As an aside, given his father's leanings, it makes one wonder if his older brother Paul had been killed fighting to defend the Papal States or fighting to help seize the Papal States. Regardless, in the 1850s, Francesco Pacenti was clothed with the Passionist habit and received the name Gabriel of the Sorrowful Mother and began his ecclesiastical studies as a Passionist student at Isola di Gran Sasso in southern Italy. Unfortunately, due to political turmoil in Italy at the time, life could be quite difficult with marauding soldiers running rampant, especially dangerous for those loyal to the church and to the sovereignty of the papal states. The Passionist province of Pieta, which Gabriel belonged to, was not immune from this chaos, and the Passionists were forced to cease their apostolic work in the area by 1860. Isola was one of the many areas overrun by Italian nationalist soldiers who terrorized the towns, looting and having their way with the locals. And this is where, while as a passionist student at the monastery near Isola, that Gabriel's supposed firearms prowess takes aim. According to the story, in 1860, 20 of Garibaldi's red-shirt soldiers entered the mountain village of Isola, Italy. They began to burn and pillage the town, terrorizing its inhabitants. 
Placenti, with his seminary rector's permission, walked into the center of the town, unarmed, to face these terrorists. One of the soldiers was dragging off a young woman whom he intended to rape when he spotted Pacenti and made a snickering remark about such a young cleric being all alone. Pacenti quickly grabbed the soldier's revolver from his belt and ordered the marauder to release the woman. The startled soldier complied. Pacenti then grabbed the revolver of another soldier who had come by. Hearing the commotion, the rest of the soldiers came running in Pacenti's direction, determined to overcome the rebellious saint. At that moment, a small lizard ran across the road between Pacenti and the soldiers. When the lizard briefly paused, Pacenti took careful aim and struck the lizard with one shot. Turning the two handguns at the approaching soldiers, Pacenti commanded them to drop their weapons. Having seen his skill with the pistol, the soldiers complied. Pacenti then ordered them to put out the fires they had set and march the whole lot of them out of the town, ordering them never to return. The grateful townspeople escorted Pacenti in triumphant procession back to the seminary, there after referring to him as the savior of Isola. So, did this fantastic tale happen? Exactly as told? Maybe. The story seems to first appear in a book about Gabriel Pacenti written many years after the saint's death, making it perhaps a bit suspicious, especially with none of the earlier accounts of his life making mention of such a fantastic tale. But, it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility. 1860 would have been the time frame when Gabrielli's red shirts captured Sicily and traveled to southern Italy fighting their way northward, so there would have been some of these soldiers in the area when the event is said to have taken place. And if a red shirt soldier was busy dragging a victim, it's possible his hands were occupied, allowing Gabriel to snatch the revolver from his holster. And given his brother's military service, it's not out of the question to think the young passionist would have known how to skillfully handle the firearm. And given the praise heaped on him by the people of Isola after his death, it's likely that Gabriel possibly may have confronted a rough group of possibly drunk red shirts who were terrorizing the town, and perhaps even chased them off. But did he adeptly bullseye a lizard and single-handedly chase 20 red shirts out of the village? Well, I suppose we'll have to leave those details to speculation and make our best guess. Less than two years after this incident, in February of 1862, Gabriel died of consumption, what today we would call tuberculosis. He was buried at the church of Isola di Gran Sasso, where his remains are still entombed. He was beatified in 1908, and many who knew him during his life were among those who were present at the beatification. This included a brother, his spiritual director and confessor, and Signor Domenico Taberi, who had been miraculously cured through Gabriel's intercession. A dozen years later, in 1920, he was canonized by Pope Benedict XV as a patron saint for Catholic youth, students, and seminarians. Although a lay organization called the St. Gabriel Pacenti Society has lobbied the Vatican to have Gabriel designated as a patron saint of handgunners. Personally, I'm more partial to long guns and handguns and would be happy if he was just named a patron saint of anything firearm related. Figure if St. Joseph of Cupertino can be a patron saint of airplane travel, despite having died 240 years before the Wright brothers' first powered flight in 1903, then clearly there's some leeway for Gabriel being named a patron saint of AR-15s and all firearms. Speaking of firearms, there's little information regarding the type of revolver St. Gabriel Presenti supposedly used against the marauding soldiers from Garibaldi's army. If the story's true that he grabbed a revolver from one of the red shirts, it was more likely a precursor to the Bodio Model 1889 double-action revolver, which became the standard-issue handgun for the Kingdom of Italy in 1891, a few decades after the saint's death. For fun, if you'd like to test your St. Gabriel Pacenti skills, the Model Bodio 1889 revolver fires a 10.4x22R round, which is somewhat dimensionally similar to the modern 9mm round. Not exactly the same thing, but... That old Italian round is an oddball and not exactly something you're going to easily find at a local gun shop. And the 9mm has a similar diameter and length, so it should probably be a good approximation for the recoil. The targeted lizard was most likely an Italian wall lizard, which grow about 5 to 10 inches long, including the tail. But to impress the soldiers, the hit likely struck the lizard's body. So without the tail, the wall lizard is about 3 to 4 inches long. So, ideally, you'll need a 9mm revolver, 
Although 9mm revolvers aren't the most common 9mm handguns in existence, so any 9mm handgun should suffice for this challenge if you only use the front iron sight. The Bodio Model 1889 revolver has a 4.5 inch long barrel, so something like the Glock 17 would be a good option for the challenge as it also has a 4.5 inch long barrel. You could try it with something more concealable, like a smaller Smith & Wesson M&P Shield 2, but with the much shorter 3 inch barrel, you will be at something of a disadvantage. So you'll need to make yourself a lizard target about the width of your thumb and 5 to 10 inches long with half of it marked as the body, which is what you're trying to hit. Then with the firearm in hand, have someone toss the target on the ground about 10 or 15 yards in front of you, which would simulate the running lizard taking a brief pause between the saint and the soldiers. And within a second or two, take aim and fire a single shot at the target. If you do try the challenge, good luck. And feel free to email Catholic History Trek and let us know how you did. And for legal reasons and all that, obviously practice safety above all else. And never operate a firearm if you don't know what you're doing. And Catholic History Trek is not advocating you go and do this, but just offering the framework for what a St. Gabriel Pacenti skill challenge would be like if one were to try such a thing. Kevin and I have covered the history of the Jesuits, the Franciscans, and the Theatines in previous episodes of Catholic History Trek. A couple of these episodes, the Society of Jesus and the Order of the Friars Minor, are two of our most listened to episodes, along with the episode on anti-Catholicism. Speaking of which, we'd be happy to know which episodes have been your favorites. Feel free to reach out to us at the email address given at the end of the episode to tell us what you think and to suggest future topics you'd like to hear us cover. Any and all suggestions or comments are welcome. While those renowned Franciscans and Jesuits received their own encompassing episodes, I felt it best to cover the history of the Passionists at the end of this episode covering one of their saints, Gabriel Pacenti. Paul Francis Denet was born to the world in 1694 at Oveda in the then Republic of Genoa, Paul was inspired to start a religious order honoring the Passion of the Lord. Seeking to live a simple life, Paul passed up a sizable inheritance left to him by an uncle who happened to be a priest. Paul kept only the breviary out of his uncle's entire inheritance. Paul was vested in a black tunic by the Bishop of Alessandria. The tunic bore the emblem of the Passion, which is still worn by the Passionist today. It is a heart topped with a cross. On the heart are inscribed the words Yesu XPI Passio, meaning the Passion of Jesus Christ. Also, the three nails of the crucifixion are on the emblem at the bottom of the heart. Paul then retired to a tiny cell to draw up the rules for the new religious congregation, which were made known to him in a vision. So sure was he of this calling that he composed the rules before any companions had been assembled to form a community. If you recall our Catholic History Trek episodes on other religious orders, this is kind of backwards. As usually, a following established, and only then are rules constructed for the growing order. Paul, who came to be known as Paul of the Cross, received informal approval for his order by Pope Benedict XIII in 1725. Sixteen years later, Pope Benedict XIV gave official approval. And, 28 years after that, in 1769, Pope Clement XIV again gave the Passionist Congregation official approval. In his bull, Supremi Epistolatus, Clement XIV also gave them the Church of Saints John and Paul in Rome, which was to become the mother house of the congregation. And, just for good measure, half a dozen years later, Pope Pius VI provided yet another confirmation and approval of the rules in his bull, Preclara Virtutum Exempla in 1775. After the approval by Benedict XIV in 1741, the congregation began to grow. This rule, which was approved quite a few times, takes the three regular vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, plus a fourth vow, a devotion to the passion of the Savior, Jesus Christ. The rule written by St. Paul of the Cross attempted to embrace both the contemplative, solitary life of the Carthusian or Trappist, and the active life of the Jesuit. Officially titled The Congregation of Discoused Clerks of the Most Holy Cross and Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Passionist, for short, are one of the mendicant orders of the Church. 
meaning they have no endowments, nor are they allowed to possess property, either in private or in common. One interesting note regarding the Passionists, according to the 1917 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, Passionists spend five hours every day in choir chanting the Divine Office. They rise at midnight and spend one hour and a half chanting matins and lauds. They abstain from flesh meats three days in the week throughout the year and during the whole of Lent and Advent. And also, they sleep on straw beds with straw pillows. I would be curious if these rigorous practices from their first two centuries lasted through their third century. So, if you are a passionist or happen to know one, feel free to contact us and let us know. In their 300-year history, the Passionists have produced a modest number of saints, although interestingly, the two most well-known saints who the Passionists claim as their own weren't technically ever members of the Passionist order. The most famous of them is St. Maria Goretti. She was catechized by a Passionist priest and received her first communion at a church administered by the Passionists, but outside of that, really wasn't connected to the Passionists. I guess that would be like calling my co-host Kevin a Franciscan because he attended a university run by Franciscans. The second eminent saint, although perhaps not as well known as St. Maria Goretti, is St. Gemma Galgani. After losing her mother at the age of eight, her father sent her to a Catholic boarding school run by the Sisters of St. Zita, which she later described as a paradise. Less than a dozen years later, Gemma was orphaned when her father passed away. She soon experienced a serious medical condition, which developed into an incurable spinal curvature and paralysis. One of the sisters gave Gemma a prayer card for a novena to the Passionist, Gabriel Presenti, who was not yet canonized or even beatified at the time. On her deathbed, Gemma prayed for Gabriel's intercession. He appeared to her and promised that she would wear the same habit that he did and that she would be blessed with a cure. In March of 1899, she received the miraculous cure. Three months later, in June of 1899, she received the stigmata, which recurred throughout the remainder of her life. She then met Passionist priest Father Cajetan, who allowed her to take private vows after listening to her incredible story. She was later introduced to Father Germano Ruopolo, who was the postulator general working for the calls of Gabriel Pacenti's beatification. Possibly due to her health problems, Gemma never took official vows into the Passionist, although she did take those private vows a few years before her death in 1903 and is buried in a Passionist convent. I don't know if I can bullseye an Italian wall lizard with a revolver, if Marie Goretti is actually a Passionist, or if the Passionists still sleep on beds of straw. But I do know that Kevin and I always end our Catholic History Trek episodes with the recitation of a Catholic prayer in the Church's historic language of Latin. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, Sicuturat in Principio et Nunc et Semper, et in Saecula Saeculorum. Amen. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek at gmail.com.